Good morning. How is everybody? Uh, we, <laughs> I don't know if we can tolerate you or not, Christy. It's a whole different issue. <laughs> You're welcome. But uh, yeah, we better tolerate her. We better learn. We are winding down our series on death and beyond the. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, one thing. We uh, we have one more lesson after today. These are questions that we've gone through, and hopefully we we've answered them correctly. Hopefully we we've done the scriptures justice, and hopefully we've helped you in some way. Especially today. Today is uh, at least the first question we want to deal with today is very much an opinion. In, in many ways, I do think it's how you look at the scriptures in, in a lot of ways. Um, <clears throat> it is to say that as we've looked at this subject, we've tried to answer the questions such as um, what is death? Is there an afterlife? Um, what What is the body like? We've answered those questions. We've answered the questions of, well, where do you go? And and this is especially the, the first question, not so much the, the second and the third question. But the first question today is one of those that if you disagree with me, that's fine. I, I want to I show you, kind of give you a little bit of a taste of both and, but uh, tell you, you can, as you read through the answer, you'll see that my opinion is somewhat slanted one way. And that doesn't mean it can't be changed, but it doesn't mean that this is one of those that, as I've said before, uh, you ask the question, are there degrees of punishment reward? And uh, you get all kinds of different answers, even from our own folks. And it's one of those that in reality, it does not, whatever you say, whatever answer you give, from the standpoint of degrees of punishment reward, it does not affect the salvation of your soul. And so while it's interesting to look at, and it's one of those that sometimes when we look at these scriptures, we say, well, I hadn't looked at it in that way, that uh, it just gives, as I think about it, one of the things that I, I try to do, one of the things that I hope to do is to challenge your thinking. And sometimes it, you'll see things that are said and you'll say, you know, I wonder why he said it. Well, what I hope that that does, and, and part of the reason for doing that, at least in my mind, is to create a thirst within you that says, let me go back to the scriptures and look at them and let me study them on my own and see what the scriptures say. And so, so sometimes when things are said and done, you go, you know, I don't understand why he said that and, or why he took that that approach. And like I say, in my mind, that's why I, I do those things, because above all things, I want you to go home and study and become well versed in the scriptures. Not that you're not already, but to, to become better versed and to to see things. I think it's important that, uh, as so many of my undergraduate professors said, I think it's so important that we put on those first century glasses. Ralph Gilmore would always take his glasses off and put them on and, and talk about the first century glasses. Well, I think we need to see scriptures from that standpoint. But I also think we have to apply them to today and to what's going on and to our thinking. And so uh, so I, I do things like that. But um, I want us to look, at, and we'll have one more lesson. The last lesson next week is not a question. It is just, uh, it's basically, it's a, it's a sermon in many ways, but it's entitled uh, All Hours Fear But One. And we're just going to talk about not having the fear of death. And because that's one of the things that so many folks deal with is, is the idea of the fear of death. And so we want to deal with that. But before we get started, are there any questions, comments, suggestions, announcements that need to be made? Good. Everybody's getting better, we hope, and doing well. But we want to talk about degrees this morning. Are there degrees of punishment reward? And uh, 
I want us to look at the scriptures. We can talk about reason, and reason seems to, to think that such is necessary and because it would seem to make sense from a reasonable standpoint that there are. But that really doesn't matter. What matters is what the scriptures say. Like I say, this is one of those things that we may disagree on, and that's fine. But just go back and read the scriptures and come up with your own belief. I was talking to someone not long ago. I think it's good for us every once in a while, no matter how long we've been Christians, to sit down and make a list of these things I believe. This is what I believe. And, and able then to to at least defend those things. You know, you can start you can start very first one, God exists. And I believe these things. And you can make a long list of things. And I think those are that's important. Well, Go back and, and, as I say, study this. Let's look, first of all, in Matthew chapter 11. Scriptures would seem to, to give us some insight into that there are degrees. In other words, there, there's hard, uh, I'm trying to get the proper grammar. There is uh, harsh punishment, of course, in hell, and then there is that which is worse, if that could be possible. And then that there are lesser degrees of reward than there are of others. And and it seems as if the scriptures say this, but once again, study on your own. But let's look at some scriptures and see what they say. In Matthew chapter 11, we want to look beginning in verse 20. I said 21, but the paragraph begins in verse 20. It says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe unto Chorazin, and woe unto Bethsaida, for if the mighty works were done in you which had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, and here's the, here's the key, that it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, you are exalted to heaven. And will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would remain it remained until this day. <clears throat> but I say unto you that it's more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. More tolerable. I don't know how you would interpret that any other way. Now you could say, well. Their punishment is severe, and it's because of their lack of, of turning and their lack of listening. Their, but you have to go back to the comparative tense that's used in the Greek text. And it's the idea of lesser to greater. And so the scripture itself would seem to imply that, well, okay, there, there is, if you will, there is a, a sense of more tolerable, less tolerable. Degrees. Well, let's look at another one. Uh, we'll look at two or three of these and we'll open it up. Luke chapter 12 is another one. And there are some people, by the way, uh, I was in a study back some time ago with with a bunch of good uh, folks that uh, that were knowledgeable in the scripture. And <clears throat> there was a belief amongst some of those as we were studying one of these scriptures, I think, and individual, two or three of those individuals made the statement that they believed in degrees of punishment, but they didn't believe in degrees of reward. So, so there's leeway here, in, at least in my way of thinking. But in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 41, let's begin in verse 41. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us, to all people? And the Lord said, who then? It is that faithful and wise servant whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them that portion of food in due season. Blessed is his servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if his servant has in his heart, or says in his heart, excuse me, my master is delaying his coming, begins to beat the male and the female servants and to eat and to drink and to be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day 
when he's not looking for him and an hour which he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. But that servant who knew his master's will did not prepare <coughs> himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Many infuse the idea here. But also who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. Everyone to whom much is given from him much be required and to whom much has been committed of him they will ask the more you have the comparative sense much few many more once again seems to imply seems to 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 say that yeah okay there are those that are going to be beaten with few stripes and there are those that are going to be beaten with more stripes well how do you determine we're going to let God do that. I want to look here in a few minutes. I want to look at the dangers of believing in degrees of punishment and reward. And and I believe there are dangers. And I need I, I, I wanted to bring that up because I think it's important that we look at that aspect of it. But you have to. Yeah, you have to say, okay, many and few, and and okay, we have this punishment, folks. I don't want to go to hell, and I don't want you to go to hell either. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I know it's a reality. I know it's going to happen, but that doesn't mean I want it to happen. The idea of many and few. Some say, well, I can take a few. Well, okay. If you're that brazen, you want to do that for an eternity. But I don't. I don't. And so when I look at this and I say, well, you know, some are beaten with many, some with few. Maybe there are degrees. Well, let's look a little bit further. Let's look. Um, let's let's just jump to Matthew because it's a long. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Once again, we have the idea of punishment. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Th these are folks that are not living the way they should. In the, the Hebrew writer, he begins this thought, really, the paragraph begins in verse 26. If we sin willfully after we've received knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And so he, he asked the question, how much worse punishment do you suppose the individuals that have done what? Well, the individuals that have rejected the Lord knowingly, the individuals that have trampled underfoot the Son of God, the individuals that have insulted God in his spirit, how much worse punishment? That's a question. <laughs> That's a question that the inspired author asked. It's a question that would lead you to believe that, okay, there's bad punishment, worse punishment. Might it be? Might it not be? Yes, that's that's the, the possibility. But yet, nevertheless, this, this passage pulls this out. We could look at, at Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, 41. It talks about a prophet's reward. I, the text doesn't explain what a prophet's reward is. I'm not sure I know what a prophet's reward is. I, I do think that a prophet, from the standpoint of one that, that speaks for God, is an individual that truly will be uh, judged upon such and so must be careful as a teacher of God. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20 and 21 speaks of being better had they never known the law to have known the law and then to have turned away from it better to have known well you might say well preacher that that really doesn't imply degrees of punishment reward yes i would agree with that but from a standpoint of why would it have been better that's the question you have to ask yourself and then we've got Romans chapter 2, verse 6, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that all deal with basically the judgment. And uh, it, of course, uh, well, let's just look. Let's look at, at Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Might be the one we're less familiar with. 
In Romans chapter 2, verse 6, we're told of God who rendered each one according to his deeds. According to his deeds. Now, let's, let's admit, you say, well, preacher, how can this be used to talk about degrees? This just simply says that they're going to be judged. And they're going to be judged based upon what they've done. And the answer is yes. That's exactly what it says. So if, if we say, well, it teaches degrees of punishment and reward, have we gone a little bit too far? Maybe so. The key teaching, at least for me in this verse, is you're going to be judged. All of us are going to be judged on the day of judgment. All of us are going to stand before the Lord and give an account of our life. And we're going to be judged upon the things that we have done, what we have said, how we have acted, our life, how we've conducted it. Reminds us what? I want to be an individual that while not only accountable, but an individual that when I give an account, I stand pure and justified before God. I want the Lord that when he opens th those books, and, you know, we've talked about here, well, 2023, we talked about, uh, we had a sermon entitled, Is My Name Written There? When, when the Lord opens that book and sees the account of my life, that the things that are wrong, the things that were bad, the things I shouldn't have done, they're, they're not there. They've been erased by the blood of Christ. They've been forgiven by the grace of God. And those things are gone. That's what I want to see. I want to make sure that my name is in that Lamb's Book of Life. And I you do too. You wouldn't be here on Sunday morning. That's important to understand, to live your life in such a way that when we stand before God, just, when we stand before the Lord and we give an account of our life, we give an account of a life it wasn't always what it should have been. It wasn't as complete as maybe we wanted it to be. But it was a life that tried. That we tried, and we tried hard to do the very best that we could. That we tried hard to, to, to live the life that God wanted us to live. That we followed the Bible as best we could. That's how I want to live my life. Because that's what I want to give an account of. I don't know how many of you have, have ever stood before a judge on the basis of something you've done. I've told you the story, I'm not going to tell you the story, of when Ethan, my son, was, um, he was probably 16, maybe 17, and he made the mistake of, of going around a school bus. Well, not going around it, but actually he was, bus was going one way, he was coming the other, and the bus threw out its stop sign, and he was right there at it, he said, and, and, and he said, I went on, and there just happened to be a policeman right behind the bus. And uh, we got the joy of standing before not one judge, but two. And now he got off. And I, like I said, I've told you the story, so I'm not going to repeat it. But basically, we stood before the first judge we stood before. And the reason that that um, he was bound over was because I knew that judge. And, and that judge, when Ethan went up, because I made him handle everything as 16, I still made him handle everything as a man. He went up uh, to, before the judge, and like I said, I knew the judge. Uh, he was a member of the church. And uh, uh, we, I was sitting there, and first thing Tony asked me, he says, uh, is your daddy here? <laughs> and so, yes, sir. And Mr. Darty, come up here. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and so uh, standing before Tony, Tony says a few things. Um, we, have, uh, we have an individual that uh, chimes in, but Tony then carries it over to the next judge, which was a smart thing to do. And we get, uh, but uh, I am told Tony does lift up his brow. He says, how you doing, Paul? As he's writing this stuff down, I said, I'm fine. He said, you might want to get a lawyer. I thought, what? So we did. We got a lawyer. I carried the lawyer back. Lawyer uh, was a great guy, a friend of mine, but um, he really hadn't made any preparation. So I didn't feel like I had to pay him that much when I paid him. But uh, and he didn't charge anything either. But the the uh, policeman said something and the chief of police said something in Ethan's behalf because they all knew him and he got off. No problems. He explained the situation. Judge Bradley took it and was fine with it. 
that's a horrifying experience. And I hope you haven't had to do that. Uh, I knew that the punishment wouldn't be that severe if it if he was punished at all, which he was not. And it's nice to know influential people and when you need them. But the, the point is, is that it's a scary thought to stand before the Lord. And you will be judged. And you need to be careful. Because, like I say, basically, for Ethan, his case was dismissed. That's how, you, in essence, I say you want, you want to hear the words, well done. Remember Matthew 25, separation of the sheep and goats? Well done good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys prepared for you. That's what you want. And so while we can sit here and talk about this, and I have through different times and with different groups talked about the degrees and the, the discussion there, one of the things that comes to my mind is the justice of God. Since we're in Romans, look at Romans chapter 9. You know, I told you the other night, I've been studying the book of Romans for my own personal good. And one of the things that I spent a couple of hours studying out of the book of Romans was the justice and the righteousness of God. Interesting, fascinating study, to, to say the least, that I enjoyed thoroughly. But the Bible talks about, and Paul talks about, there's justice with God. Notice that he asked the question, what shall, we, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. In other words, God's going to always do the right thing, no matter what. You know, sometimes we, we grapple with the idea of doing the right thing. You know, this benefits me, but over here is the right thing. What do I do? Well, you do the right thing. That's what the Lord would do. He always does what's righteous. But in his righteousness and in his justice, he's fair, equal. Justice is the idea of fair and equal. But fair and equal to all, not just some. For God is no respecter of what? Persons. Yeah. And so he has to do what's fair to one and to the other. And so you ask yourself, is it fair? Now, now we're just posing this question. Is it fair? Is it fair for the individual that, let's just say, has been a Christian for many, many years and been faithful in their service, been faithful in, in their duties, their Christian duties, have used all their talents to the best of their ability? Is it fair for them to get the same reward as the individual that say was only a Christian for five years, but for all of that time in their life, except for the last five years, they rejected God, lived the way they wanted to, knew what was right, but wouldn't do it. I'm going to leave all that up to God. I really am. But I'm going to say that the justice of God would imply, okay, well, maybe there are degrees of punishment rule. Now, what does that mean and how does that entail? Does that mean that the, the person, let's just let's use the idea of reward, that the person that gets the lesser reward, that, the, that heaven's just all right to them? I don't know. I don't know. Once again, I'm not too worried about it. I'm worried about getting there. And that's what's important. I do appreciate what my wife says, not recently, but she has said it on several occasions if she's thinking about it or if she's been studying it or something's been said in a class that she's been taking or whatever. She'll look at me and she said, she'll say, you know, if the Lord says the rest of them can come on in, she said, I'm not going to get too mad. I said, just as long as he lets me in. And so I don't believe he's going to change the rules. I don't believe he's going to change the parameters. But you say he's God and he can. You're right. And I'm not going to argue with him. Well, these verses and others seem to, to imply such. I've given you a note there on the back on page two. All of these verses point to the justice and fairness of God would be just for the most hardened sinner to receive the exact degree of punishment as one who's misinformed in life. Should a martyr receive the same rewards as a babe in Christ? 
What about the individual that's in a third world country that hasn't heard the word of God? I'm going to leave that up to the justice of God, but also the mercy of God. Here's some dangers that I do want you to think about. Whether you hold to the idea, well, there's there are degrees of punishment reward or not. Whether you hold to it, here's some things to, to really keep in mind. First of all, some would begin to make God such a hard God that he'd not allow but one or two to enter into heaven because he knows that some folks will be punished, but they'll receive the lesser reward or the lesser degree of punishment. Well, I've given you Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, Romans 2, 4, 2 Peter 3, verse 10, talks about the grace of God. The grace of God. You got to be careful. You got to you got to remember. You got to balance all this out. The Bible talks about justice of God. Yes. Remember what Paul said. Behold the goodness and the what of God. Severity of God. There's two sides to God, whether we realize it or not. Don't make him though too severe, but also don't make him too lax. There's a balance that needs to be had, a balance of the two, because actually he has both sides, a severe side and a good side. We need to be careful because God does have grace and God will use his grace and God will provide his grace to us all. But a second to danger that we, we need to be careful when thinking and discussing this subject is we can commit sin and we can remain in such a state and still get to heaven. That's the thought of some. But the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, Luke 13, 27, tell us that sin must be repented of in order for God to forgive it. We're not perfect, and, and, and I want you to, to understand what I'm saying. We're not perfect. The individual that you talk to and say, hey, come to church with me, and they say, I'm not going to church down there. Well, why not? A bunch of hypocrites down there. We're not hypocrites. Matter of fact, we're probably the opposite of hypocrites. Why? Because we realize we need the Lord. We realize that we've got to reach out to a God that's gracious and merciful and forgiving, and he'll reach back to us. We realize that we're sinners. We realize that God is the father of us all, and he's the one that we are answerable to. We realize that. So we have to be careful in saying, wait a minute, sin is prevalent in our life. But if we have become New Testament children of God, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, I only run across that very quickly because I see all y'all, I know pretty much where you stand, plan of salvation. But also, as long as we're walking in the light, season of life, First John chapter 1, verse 7, have fellowship one with another, blood of Christ cleanses us. This idea of continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, what about, you know, James 5 asks it that uh, it says that basically it's the we've taught uh, through years the, the fact that that as public as the sin is, is as public as the confession needs to be made. Yes. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails or works much. Yes. But we have to be acknowledgers of what we've done that's wrong. And so we have to be careful when we study the subject not to say, well, you know, the sin, the sin that we commit, we still get into heaven. It's got to be forgiven. I've run into this just in this discussion, and that is, well, I'll just slide into heaven. I, I asked an individual this once. I said, what if you slide right past it? Oh, oh, hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Uh, Lord willing, come back tonight. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer. The idea of sanctify is the idea of set apart God in your heart. I've already given away half my sermon. So I don't need to come back tonight. <laughs> no, come on.
we still have more to say. But it's the idea of making the Lord first in your life. Don't You can't just slide anywhere. Next, those with fewer abilities will receive a lesser rewards. Now, Jesus, if you really think about what he taught, he said, do what you can with what you have where you are. Mark 14, remember the, the lady there? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not questioning. I'm just trying to cover a bunch of stuff today and trying to wind this series out. Uh, go back and, and read Mark chapter 14. And I think one of the things you find out is, is that God expects us to, to do what we can with what we have where we are. If you're still there in Romans, if you flip over, at least for me, a page in Romans chapter 12, I, I, I like this. I used this not long ago or several times I've used it with people. But, but it talks about verse 6 of, of Romans 12 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace which is given to us, let us use them. Use what you got. But there are some that have said, well, you know, what about this? Well, I'm, once again, I'm going to leave it to God. Then some would suggest that God's watching. And he's giving out merits and demerits. And this was actually a thought. If you go back to the book of James, this is, a, this is an old thought that people had. And that is that, that God is, is watching you. And okay, okay, you did this wrong. Well, you get a demerit. Okay, you did this right. Well, you, you get a merit. You know, you, you did good over here, and at the end, we're going to weigh the scales, the balance scales. And wherever it tilts, that's where we're going to be. Well, like I say, this was an old teaching, especially out of the book of James. But once again, what about God's grace? What about God's forgiveness? Uh, I think we've already covered this, but uh, one individual <coughs> shared with me once that, well, I can survive a lesser degree of hell. I don't want to try. I don't want to try. Suzanne and I, Suzanne, Ethan, and I, Ethan was younger. We went into one of these caves, Mammoth Cave, I think. I, don't, I can't remember anyway. They set you down. They turned out the lights pitch dark. Nope. Don't want to have that. Paul Darty, do you sleep with the nightlight? You better believe it. I don't. I don't want to be in utter darkness. I don't want that. Seventhly, this is not on your list, but there are different degrees of sin, and some would be allowed. That's the thought some have. If well, if there's a degrees of punishment reward, then some sins are not as heavy. Some sins are not as bad as others. Sin, 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 sin with God. One sin will keep you out. One sin will, will uh, if forgiven, won't keep you out. When you think about when God makes a list of sins, wherever they are, you know, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, it talks about putting off these things. 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about sins there. Paul talks about some of his sins. Paul even says that he was the chief of sinners. Remember, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And yet, when you look at that, none of them really were any more. You know, well, if I go out here and I rob a store, that's worse than beating my kid. How do you justify that? I've run into people that have tried. So you have those things. Now, now some would say, looking on the flip side, if you look in Matthew chapter 20, and like I say, I won't cover all that, but if you look in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, let's just, let's just flip over there. We're not going to spend time reading it, but Matthew chapter 20. It's the parable there of the workers in the vineyard. And we talked about this parable when we talked about parables in 2023. So we'll not go back over it. Uh, again, at least not right now. We will some other time for another purpose, but not today. 
this is, you know, where workers are hired at different times of the day and each are given basically the same reward. Some have said, well, this proves that there are, are not degrees of at least punishment or reward or especially reward that God gives to all. Well, the point is, if you look at the parable, it's the fact that they are rewarded and it's not the fact of how much they are rewarded. It doesn't talk about the degrees. The point of the parable really, in many ways, at least the way I see it, is this. You've been a Christian for 50 years. John Doe over here has been a Christian for five. You mean you because you've been a Christian for 50 years get heaven and just because he's been a Christian for five, he does not? Now, this gets us into those deathbed confessions, right? Jerry's probably had to deal with questions along these lines as well through the years. It's always a difficult thing, and I leave it in the hands of God. You know, uh, I've gone into to hospital rooms, rooms at, at home bedrooms, and sat and talked with individuals that are about to die. Some have called me to their bedside. I didn't know that they were at that point, but they would call me to their bedside. Preacher, I've done X, Y, Z. I need forgiveness. Okay. Well, what about that person? I don't know. I'm going to do what God's told me to do. I'm going to talk to them. If they're a child of God, a Christian, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to take it to the church because I'm going to ask them, can I take this to the church? I'm going to take it to the church and say, Brother so-and-so passed away on Tuesday, but here Brother so-and-so told me this, and we did this, and we're going to do it as a congregation as well, even though you'd say, well, it's too late. Yes, but our responsibility still is to pray for that individual. That I leave in the hands of God. I walked in about six or seven years ago. I was called in by family. They were all, well, the wife, the wife was a member of the church. The husband, the husband was a, is a good guy. I shouldn't use the word was, he is. The husband is a good guy. Matter of fact, uh, he introduced me a couple of times out in public. We just happened to be in the same place. And he would say, this is my preacher. And I'm thinking, I've never seen you at church. But, you know, I was his preacher. <laughs> and so, um, but his brother. His brother, his actually he was it was been his adopted well, he was adopted in the family and so the brother was biological. But anyway, just his brother. He said uh, the wife said, Will you go in there and talk to him? Said he's about to die. And so I did. And so I asked him, I said, you know. Is there anything you want to repent of? Is there anything you want to acknowledge? Anything you want to straighten out with God? No, I'm fine. He died rejecting God from beginning to end. I'm going to leave that in the hands of God. I'm going to leave it in the hands of God. I did not feel comfortable leaving. I did have prayer with him and for him but I still leave it in the hands of God. So we need to be careful. Anything you might like to say? We haven't really opened it up. Anything you might like to say? Ask. Well, can you explain hell? I can tell you what the Bible says about it. It's a real place. And it is eternal. The Bible, if you look at what the Bible has to say about hell, it's a place of punishment. Revelation chapter 19, 20. In chapter 20, it's described as unquenchable, everlasting, and eternal. It's said to be prepared for certain ones. 
Here's the thing I believe the Bible teaches that we need to be careful with regards to hell. We need to understand it is real. Just as heaven is real, it is real. Now, a lot of folks want to discount hell in a lot of different ways. Some will discount it from the standpoint of saying, well, it's not that bad. You're reading the same Bible I'm reading? Second of all, well, it's really not it's really not fire. Well, just like we've talked about before, when we've talked about heaven and we've talked about we use physical images and physical descriptions to talk about a spiritual place. And so we come away with a picture and we say, well, is heaven really going to be made of streets of gold and gates of pearl and and, and we look at that and ask ourselves that question, and once again, we're using physical images and physical descriptions, adjectives, to, to describe a spiritual place. And I say, well, I don't know, but I, I don't think so, but I do know this. is If it's using these wonderful terms to talk about heaven, then heaven's going to be a wonderful place. And, you know, I think about... Something, too. I thought about this the other day as I was thinking about this lesson. Six days, the Lord created the world and all things therein. Boom. Bam. Spoke into existence. Everything. And it's mighty good. And it's mighty amazing. And when you look in John chapter 14, where Jesus makes the statement, I go to prepare a place for you. The idea of prepared is not in the tense that would imply what is called, as we've called it before, punctiliar action. It's linear action. Punctiliar action is, in other words, it's something that was said, done, period, over with. Linear is constant, continual. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And the idea there is it's still being prepared. Does that tell you how wonderful heaven's going to be? If in six days the Lord could speak this world into creation and put everything in it, and it be as it is. You might say, well, earth is not perfect. Well, we've screwed it up. We've messed it up. It's changed. Yes, it's changed through the years. You know, dinosaurs once walked the face of the earth. <gasps> Preacher, you can't believe that you're a Christian. Yeah, I do believe it. <laughs> Yeah, it did happen. It's changed. Now, I don't believe dinosaurs were necessarily as they're portrayed so many times uh, to our kids. I think maybe dinosaurs have gotten an unfair shake on some of that. But if God can speak and prepare this world this way, just think about heaven. Don't you want to go? But hell is a real place. Now, some some have through the years have said that hell will only last for a little while. In other words, if if you hear the words depart from me for I never knew you, you'll go to hell and and some have said well there's annihilation in which you, you will not be and so they deny even the the thought of hell. But then some say well hell will be but just for a period of time, but that's not what the Bible says. If you're in Matthew, look in Matthew 25. You're familiar with this passage, I know. But Matthew 25, verse 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. Don't know when you were a kid how your parents disciplined you. May not have. My mother and father believed in the adage, spare the rod, spoil the child, and they didn't want me to be spoiled. <laughs> As I've told you before, uh, I was taken out twice every worship service and explained why I was, what I was doing was wrong. My mother in her old age admitted, well, we were probably too hard on you and expected you to sit too, too still during church. Thanks, mom.
when you were punished as a child, if you were, and like I said, I don't know how you were, were disciplined. I was paddled. But if you were paddled, that was far better than being grounded. Why? Over with. <laughs> It hurts. Don't get me wrong. It hurts, but it's over with. Grounding can last for a week, two weeks, months, you know. And I know you say, well, I get them to give in, so it still lasts. You still have that reminder. Hell is eternal. Just as heaven is mentioned as eternal, everlasting. Notice in our passage, we just used the one passage. There's a lot there. It's eternal. It lasts forever. Now, there are horrors. Like I said, it's described from the standpoint of darkness, destruction, destruction of well-being. In other words, it's not a, pla- it's not a place you want to go. It's not a place you want to go and, and get healthy, so to speak. There's the wailing and gnashing of teeth. Can you imagine the, the just listen constantly to the grinding of teeth? It's destiny, of course, is eternal. We just looked at that. It's inhabited by the most horrible of people. I believe it was W.C. Fields that said, when asked about eternity, he said, I'd like to go to heaven for the ambiance, but to go to hell to talk to the characters there. I wouldn't. Of course, he was trying to be funny. But it's inhabited by some of the most horrible of of company. And also it's referred to as a second death. And this is where a lot of folks say, well, there's annihilation. Second death from the standpoint of separation. Remember, we talked about death. We when we talked about death, we said it's not an ending other than from a physical standpoint, but we still continue on. It's a separation, James 2, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, separation of the body and spirit. But what about heaven? Revelation 21 is a great place to start. And I love to to read Revelation 21. I love the the first image of the idea of a bride adorned for a bridegroom. I've seen a lot of of brides. I've seen a lot of brides that were, and and don't don't pick me on this one, but average-looking girls. I mean, you know, pretty, but just average. And, man, when they come down that aisle and you're standing down in front, and they got this smile on their face, their makeup's perfect, their hair is perfect. I mean, everything is just perfect. And you look at them, and you think, boy, they're pretty. See why, you know, you, sometimes you, you nudge them, boy, see why you're marrying her. Well, heaven's described in that way. It's described as, as being cubed or perfect in its Everything in every way. And so I've given you sort of just an outline there, the gladness that's found in heaven, the glory that's found in heaven. It's gorgeous. It talks about all the the different, um, what we would call the different minerals that are there and and the goodness that's there, the folks that are there, the the fact that there's not going to be more tears. There is an interesting thought. I ran across this the other day and I had, don't believe I had ever thought of it this way, and I'm still I'm still processing it. And notice what it says: that God shall wipe away all tears. And this writer said, "Does that not, does that mean then that there are tears?" Now, that, like I say, I'm still processing because what does it say? God shall wipe away all tears, and there shall be no more crying. I don't know. I really don't have an answer for that one. I had never thought to that point. I just always thought, well, you know, heaven's not going to be in tears. And you say, well, okay, it's a spiritual place, so tears are a physical thing. And so you process that. Give that some thought. Just kind of run it over in your mind a few times this week. See what you come up with. As a conclusion to the lesson, hell's horrible and, and should be avoided at all costs. Heaven's wonderful and should be pursued. <clears throat> Death is not one of those things we want to sit around and talk about. It's one of those things that we're interested in. How's it going to be? What are we going to be like? And then when we begin to study it, what do we find out? We've really got more questions than maybe we've got answers. And it's okay. 
Live your life. Live your life in such a way that God will, the Lord will be able to say, well done. And then we can all walk in hand in hand, arm in arm together. You know, I, I think I've told you at Pomona, when I was at Pomona, we had a tradition, and that's all it was. It was a tradition. It started before I got there. It was continued until I left. And that is that when someone came forward and wanted to be baptized into Jesus Christ, we would take their confession. We would baptize them then. And as they came up out of the water, some wonderful soul would start the song, I want to see. And, of course, it's an echo song. I want to see. And we'd start with the first person that just was baptized. I want to see up in heaven up there. And we'd sing that song. We'd sing it through, and we'd sing four or five different rounds, depending on who the leader would include. But the idea that was we tried to impress upon the individual that was baptized is that we all want to get there, and we all want to walk in hand in hand. That's what I want. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for my family, and I'm sure you want it for your family. What do we do? Keep praying for those individuals that are lost. Pray for strength for those that are walking the best they know how. Pray that if we have family members that are not doing what they need to be doing, that God will give us the opportunity and also the words to help them straighten out their life and be ready to give an answer. We'll talk about that tonight. Anything else? Next week, we're going to talk about, as I said, of all hours, fear but one. And we'll wrap this up as far as talking about death and dying. Anything else? Well, we've run through and not just thoroughly discussed a lot of things, and maybe that's upset you. But I've given you enough information that <clears throat> you can go home and, and study it on your own. And hopefully it helps you. It's one of those subjects, I think, with regards to degrees of punishment reward. It's one of those things, okay, if you believe it, you believe it. If you don't, you don't. Let's just get to heaven. Anything else? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day, thankful that you love us and that you watch over us, thankful for the way that you provide for us, that each day as we rise, we have strength, we have health, that we're able to to meet each day with with new degree of of happiness, but also with a new degree of vim, vigor, and vitality. We're thankful for your word, for what it means to us, for the fact that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And while our subject this morning often intrigues individuals into thinking and studying and looking and, and talking about, let us understand that we live here upon this earth in order to glorify you, in order to praise you, in order to to bring you the the glory and honor that you deserve, that we live our life in such a way and help us to live our lives in such a way that we will be found as faithful children of yours and that we will hear those marvelous words, well done. We ask that you be with those that we know and love that are not walking in the way that they should walk. Give us the words, give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the conviction to be able to say something to them with love and gentleness and meekness and kindness. We ask that you be with us as a congregation that will always follow your will and do the things that you would have us to do. Be with us that we may live with you and for you. Hold us now as we hold to you. Forgive us of our sins, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. Hope you have a great week.